So we've got a range of soft and hard pencils and some wonderful watercolour graphite that we're going to use in this portrait of Bella. Starting off with the sepia pencil, this gives a nice soft structure that won't dominate what I choose to do next. So just starting with the centre of the skull, always a good place to start. And sketching in, trying to get a balance. Here we go with the eye sockets. That's probably the most important part of any kind of portrait is to get the eye sockets in the right place so that they're balanced. And technically the centre of the eye, the pupil, will be in a straight horizontal line between the two. Um, if that goes wrong, then you end up with a very confused looking greyhound. And we know that greyhounds are not confused at all. So the greyhound is a small in comparison to their head and they're made up of multiples of folds. Um, not important to be anatomically correct at this stage with the folds of the ears, but just to sketch out the proportion of the ears to the top of the head. Now I'm just gonna work a little bit the eye pupil is, of course, um, the eyeball is a perfect circle, but we don't see the whole of the pupil because of the eyelid. And the cheekbones, those beautiful cheekbones of the greyhound, the elongated nose, which flattens out from underneath the eyes to the top of the nose. Now, I see some beautiful shapes coming in that I draw as a series of sort of triangles, really and the folds of the skin. Pressing a little bit harder on the pencil now just to firm up some of the uh, drawing that I will lock into place for later on. Okay, round the nose, following the line of the skull through the jaw. It's a bit like mapping out a journey when you're going from A to B. You can keep checking with your pencil and your eye and, and going vertically and horizontally up and down. Are they level? Is you know We're not going to concentrate too much on measuring. This is a real test of drawing from life. Right, so now I'm going to pick up my, dipping my paintbrush into the big jar of water and using this wonderful soluble graphite palette. So it, I'm starting to sculpt and build on tone to give the drawing some three-dimensional um, qualities. Popping in some obvious dark blacks, again, to anchor the drawing pretty precisely and using the natural um, water held in the in the brush bristles to get some beautiful watercolour effects. So the, the paper I'm using is not watercolour paper, I hasten to add, it's a cartridge um, sketch pad. I'm not going to overdo it with the water, otherwise the paper will start to um, deteriorate. So I've got to work quite quickly here. Um, I can pick up a little bit of that black with water if I want to. So yeah, I'm sort of correcting some of those earlier sepia lines um, as I go, blocking them out with the graphite, looking at not just the tone, but also what's going on in the greyhound's skull. There's a really strong line that goes from the cranium down between the eyes and to the nose, which you can keep referring back to if you're not sure how wide to make things or, or whether or not you've got a balance between the right and the left side of the of the greyhound's face. She's also obviously got light coming in from the right hand side on the photograph so we can start blocking in some shadows. Sort of following those sketch lines from before, they're just there to give me a marker and this beautiful black nose. So there's nothing at the moment in the drawing that is dominant. We're still basically mid greys going towards the dark, but plenty of room to add later on. Right. There's a hint of the mouth there, that lovely greyhound smile. And the schnozzle, as my dad used to call it, the muzzle of the greyhound. So we're starting to see the whole head emerging now, which is really lovely. So what I'm doing is I'm trying not to concentrate too much on one area at this stage, um, sort of whittling it away, feeling the balance between the marks I'm making. So also the greyhounds have got lovely all over short hair with lots of different directions on their head. So you can start without drawing every single um, bristle, which would be impossible, start 
suggesting the lay of that fur, which again gives the drawing some three-dimensional qualities and some texture and some expression to the greyhound as well. And those beautiful eyeliner made up eyes, which are very hypnotic. So there will be uh, more black added to that as we go on, but I don't want to overdo it at this stage because that's easy to do. I'm using this lovely soft black pencil. Um, it's almost a charcoal, but it doesn't smudge in the same way um, and sits quite happily on top of this cartridge paper. A little bit of drawing and deepening those shadows where they need to be. So I'm a great fan of keeping the nibs of my pencil sharp, but as we go along, obviously they're going to get softer and softer and there'll be a point where I decide to sharpen them. But while it's still a fairly soft and broad uh, lead, I can block in some of those shadows quite nicely and quite quickly. So the nose is now becoming more prominent than the eyes. Right. So the, the 4B pencil, I've got two pencils there. The 4B pencil is a water-soluble pencil. It's probably the lighter one of the three. And it means if I do use the watercolour graphite on top, it will blend and disappear a little bit. So it gives another um, visual quality. Those lovely whiskers, one chance only to get those right. Yeah, blocking in her hint of her smile. Lovely cheekbones again. So looking at the photograph or from life, depending on how you're going to draw, your eyes are constantly darting from your subject to your paper. So it helps not to take your pencil or your brush off the paper when that's happening, because you can carry on from where you left off and you're obviously working quite fast, so you don't want to lose time trying to figure out where it was that you last made your, your pencil mark. So yeah, blocking in that ear. Right. It looks like I'm doing my sh shading quite randomly, but I'm trying to, I'm conscious of making pencil marks that are in the direction of how Bella's fur lies. Um, quite often what happens when you're shading in, you just do the same old cross hatching. If you're right handed, it's obviously horizontal left down, uh, sorry, horizontal right down to left and the other way around if you're left handed. But of course that doesn't work for both sides of the head because the fur will be lying in different directions. So that's just a conscious um, effort. And obviously you can see from the photograph some of her darker skin coming through in patches under her lighter fur. So that again gives you a really good clue as to how her fur is lying on her skull. So clarifying that bump on the top of the head, quite significant, and firming up the right hand side and that right eyelid and yep the whiskers go in which are balanced by her sort of quizzical eyebrow on the left giving her even more of a wise look. Of course, everybody's greyhound has a different personality and Bella's particular qualities are one of wisdom. Um, it took us quite a while to get her to pose for this shot. Her favourite position is lying sideways with her eyes shut on a beanbag. So, um, yeah, that probably took as long as it did for me to get my materials ready, is to get Bella prepared for her shot. So still using the three graphite pencils. So the colours really now, the sepia pencil has almost disappeared and we're really just working in grey tones for now. At any point, you could stop your drawing and say it's finished. That's a real personal decision. It could remain a black and white or tonal study or it could progress to something else. So the, the skills and the techniques are still the same. You're just putting more layers on and more little features. And it is very hard to know when to stop. Uh, 
So decision, little minute decisions are being made all the time between the hand and the eye. This is obviously um, the beautiful thing about drawing from life is that you are in the moment and you are really observing and you don't really know what it really looks like until you've finished. So now I'm adding some more shadows. Now that's partly because I want to add more interest on the right hand side, which as you know, from the photograph has got more light on it. So it means I'm gonna to have to deepen those shadows on the left hand side as well. So that's what's happening now. Um, watercolour brushes are designed specifically to hold a lot of water. So you use the tip and the side of the brush simultaneously, depending on whether you want to draw with your brush or do a wash. Putting the collar in is given a frame to the head. So she's just not floating in suspense. Right, now here, here we're going with some colour. So I've only chosen two colours, the sepia and the ochre. But you'll see as we build up the various tones. Um, these are plastic based crayons. I like them because they're not just a lead. As they soften down, you can use the side of them as well. Um, you could probably use a pastel, although you don't want to use an oil pastel with water-based washes and um, pencil. And at the moment, I'm sort of doing a little bit of what I was doing with the graphite pencil, which is blocking in tone with the sepia and also um, adding to the direction of her fur. So it's still the same techniques, but just using a different colour. And of course, her eyes are a beautiful shade of brown, so I wanted to bring those out. And all sorts of wonderful tones and colours happen when you layer one or two colours on top of each other. So I'm not concentrating on making her brown all over. That would completely ruin the effect. Plus, we also have natural highlights coming through now. So there's very little actual white on Bella, but you want to make sure that that little glint in the eye is there. That, what's, that is what gives life to the eye, also on the nose. And mindful that we're working with white paper, so there's going to be a lot of white showing through the pencil marks anyway. So now I can block in using the side of the sepia pencil, um, almost providing a wash of pale brown on top of some of the areas of the drawing. Could, I could have chosen to use a watercolour wash um, but again, I'm not using watercolour paper, so I didn't want to overload the paper with too much liquid at this point. But these pencils work just fine. And the great thing is I can work on top of them, again, with the graphite pencils quite easily. Right, so solidifying that juicy nose. The most important thing is to draw what you see. If you're working from a photograph or from life, you can't really go wrong. If you're working from an academic point of view, that is measuring um, anatomically correct, then obviously it's a different technique. However, I, ha I am very aware of those uh, characteristics because I've been drawing for a long time. But again, if you draw what you see, they should come out. So this is a fun part, a bit of doodling the pattern work on the collar that Maya made last podcast. Again, it gives a nice contrast to the um, painterly tonal part of the drawing just to do some fun pattern lines in there, just using the soft pencil. If you wanted to, you could make it look more like the photograph and add blacks as well. So there's no rules at this stage. If I did that, it'd be another 10 minutes on the podcast, wouldn't it? <laughs> so, yep, yeah, now I'm filling in that area there, under the chin, around by the ear, so that you get more of an impression of a neck without me having to draw the whole of the body. So this is my, the fun part, right, at the end, is to use the ochre crayon to do a golden wash. Again, not all over the drawing. That would be too much like colouring in, finding intuitively the focal points, the rich 
tones in the photograph and concentrating on those. Um, for those of you who have got eagle eyes, my crayon snapped in half about a minute ago, which was quite frustrating because it means that you hold the pencil quite differently. But I've soldered on because I want to get this drawing finished. And those lovely glowing golden tones. Again, she's um, a fawn greyhound. So if you've got a brindle greyhound or a greyhound who's got patches, you're going to be using different coloured crayons, same technique, but in a different way to um, yeah, to render the markings of your particular greyhound. But you could see how easily that could become a brindle or a patch or tri-coloured greyhound as well. So that warm colour really accentuates the edges of the mouth, the nose, unifies the drawing so she's not got colour in uh, only one part of the drawing, that it's, it's spread throughout. Ordinary pencil cranes would also work as well as these plastic cranes. And just be aware of the pressure that you're putting on the crayon. Obviously, the harder you press, the darker the tone. So um, that's all part of it as well. Getting as many variations out of your one pencil as you can. Okay. Are we ready to stop? Almost. Now that that gra earlier graphite wash has dried a little bit, it's gone a bit paler, so I'm just putting a little bit more on. It's much, much easier to put more on than it is to take off. There are techniques where you can use erasers, um, but for fine line work, you'll end up smudging. So much easier to start subtle and build it up. And here we go. Signed, sealed and delivered. Enjoy. Have a go. Kia ora, welcome to my artist studio. This is my first interview in a studio and you probably want to know why I am on a Greyhound podcast. Hey, well, my friend Maya um, founded Hounds for Life and I uh, am a good friend of hers and I was with her when she picked up her very first Greyhound, who is Bella. So it's really appropriate that I also chose to draw Bella as well for this podcast. And um, I have drawn many, many things in my life. So I'm a professional illustrator. I also work with textiles. I also teach and facilitate workshops for all sorts of different groups in the community. For instance, today I was actually teaching pirate school in Picton. Um, but I'm going to show you a, just a range of some of the work I've done over the years. Now, if you remember from, uh, or if you hear from my podcast, I'm talking about training the eye and the hand to work together and really that is the basis of all drawing and all art. So you have your imagination but also you can draw from life. So as an illustrator, um, the aim is to tell a story using pictures. Even if you're following a, st a written story, the pictures should also tell a story on their own. So one of the first things I did when I started as an illustrator was to draw um, people in different situations and that was fashion illustration. I don't do that very often anymore but I started working for newspapers and magazines and here are some of the early work that I did. So this is a very colourful piece. It actually was used for um, a video game in the early days and it's an imagina imaginary uh, scene of an island using watercolour inks and um, gouache, which is like a poster paint. And I did many, many drawings that all fitted together like a story for this one. Here, I'm quite often asked to do logos or ideas for businesses. And here's a, a pen and ink drawing that I did for Earthbound Kitchen, which funnily enough is on the same site as Hounds for Life. And we have a beautiful permaculture homestead where we grow our veggies and our food. And um, I was very happy to do that design. So I get asked to do lots of very interesting things, as you can imagine. 
This is more recent work, so the love of drawing people. Uh, this is an illustration done for a magazine where they were focusing on an article about bullying at school. So I've used a similar technique to the podcast where I've drawn first and then I've used a tone to make the form stand out, which is the grey tone here, and then I've worked over it in line. Quite often I'm asked to do pictures for children's books. Here is a New Zealand children's story, true story about a rescued Kiwi um, in the South Island. And it was a lovely story to do. I had to do quite a lot of research. I won't show you the whole book, but this is one of my favourite pages here. It's about a kiwi egg that had been dislodged by a digger in the bush and had, through a series of lots and lots of different people doing different things, been rescued and then hatched when uh, it reached the Kiwi Sanctuary and then eventually was put back into the wild. So it's a story that lots of schools really enjoy because it teaches uh, all sorts of things about how to look after wildlife but also it's a success story and it's local. So that was a lovely uh, story to do. And then last year I was asked to do illustrate a story by the New Zealand School Journal. Again, I really enjoy doing work that I know is going to be used by many, many people and encourage them to read and to draw and to make up stories themselves. And so this story is called The Little Fisherman and um, again based on a combination of working from photographs and from the story itself. Some of the fun things I do outside of my commission work is drawing portraits, painting portraits. So when I paint or drew Bella, uh, instead of drawing a human face, I drew a dog face and it was um, using the same principles. So um, two of my paintings that are here are of close personal friends of mine. Uh, every other year, the New Zealand Portrait Gallery runs an award and the top portrait is of my friend Sarah, who is a potter. So it's called The Potter. And um, this portrait ended up touring around New Zealand as part of the Adam Portrait Award, which was wonderful. I focus a lot on hands as well as faces because I believe that the hands tell you as much about a person as the face does. And also it gives you another dimension to the portrait. And then the other portrait is of my friend Peter. And he has, uh, he comes from the top of the South Island and he has led um, a very interesting life and that shows in his portrait. Okay and then the another portrait I've just started working painting uh, acrylics onto the back of glass, reverse painting onto glass which is quite a challenge and I enjoy the surprise aspect of that. So I have a painting here, a, a very recent one called Sanctuary. And finally my textile work. Um, I trained as a textile artist at I uh, did an embroidery degree way, way back. And I still like to use stitching, collage, uh, working with my own images, which I then print onto lamination and make into different panels. So these three are from a series um, of stories about uh, women in three different stages of their life. The young woman is courage. The middle-aged woman is uh, compassion and the older woman is wisdom, so it's our journey through life. I like to use recycled materials or resource materials as well. And a few years ago I found a whole lot of these wonderful books in the op shop, in the second-hand shop in, in New Zealand, and they're the old Reader's Digest books from the 1960s and the 1970s. They have these gorgeous printed covers which are uh, like a cloth surface. I really like them and I really wanted to do something with them that would um, save them from going into landfill. So I collected a whole pile and I went through them and took out the illustrations which are uh, very cheaply printed, not particularly good quality, and took out some of the sentences as well and I made, I've been making lots of collages from them which are quite humorous and um, quite fun. I also add a little bit of paint and um, make it into a whole new piece of artwork. 
So I've always got projects on the go. I really enjoy having commissions from all sorts of different people, uh, whether it's uh, a shop that needs a logo or a local business or an um, educational book or a beauty magazine or an environmental project. Um, I really don't mind. It keeps me really interested. And um, I very much hope you enjoy looking at my website and thinking about your creative space and how you can use it because it's great fun. So thank you very much for listening. See you again. Ka kite ano.